Years ago, I read a story about a very wealthy man who stood to testify in church. And when he stood up, he explained to the congregation that he had been a very poor man. And he told the story of how when he was very, very poor as a very young man, he had been challenged to give all that he had to the Lord. And so this very poor young man said, I gave everything that I had to the Lord. He determined to give it at that time. So as he's now sharing his testimony, he says, that was a long, long time ago, and now I'm very wealthy. I have lots of houses. I have beautiful cars. I have boats. I have property. And God has allowed me to end up with a lot of money, and I'm very grateful. And all of this is a testament to God's faithfulness because I chose to give him all that I had. And from the back of the worship center, an elderly lady said very loudly, I dare you to do it again. There's nothing wrong with having possessions. There's nothing wrong with having a nice home or a car or even a boat and so forth. As I'm sure you've heard, there's really nothing wrong with having possessions. The challenge is making sure those possessions don't have you. There can be a lot of things that we allow to keep us from being all in with Jesus. Really, anything that we are willing to hold more tightly to than Jesus is a problem. And frankly, in many ways, whatever that happens to be could very well become an idol in your life, in my life. Don't hold more tightly to anything than you hold to Jesus. It can be material possessions. It can be a career. It can be Uh, relationships, it can be education, it can be hobbies, it can be plans. A lot of people try to convince themselves that they're going to heaven because of their goodness, because of their service, or because of their supposed faithfulness. Such is the case with the wealthy young man whose life we're going to be looking at today. So we continue in our study, the gospel according to Matthew. This morning's message, Tell Yourself the Truth, and we're in Matthew chapter 19, And we're going to begin reading with verse 13, Matthew 19, verse 13. This morning I'll be reading from the Christian Standard Bible. And I invite you to stand, please, for the reading of the Word of God. Then children were brought to Jesus for Him to place His hands on them and pray. But the disciples rebuked them. Jesus said, Leave the children alone and don't try to keep them from coming to Me because the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. After placing his hands on them, he went on from there. Just then someone came up and asked him, Teacher, what good must I do to have eternal life? Why do you ask me about what is good? He said to him, There is only one who is good. If you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Which ones? He asked him. Jesus answered, Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor your father and your mother, and love your neighbor as yourself. I have kept all these, the young man told him. What do I still lack? If you want to be perfect, Jesus said to him, go sell your belongings and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. When the young man heard that, he went away grieving because he had many possessions. Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I tell you, it will be hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were utterly astonished and asked, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Then Peter responded to him, See, we have left everything and followed you, so what will be there for us? Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, in the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on His glorious throne, you who have followed Me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or fields because of my name will receive a hundred times more and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. Thank you so much. You may be seated. Tell yourself the truth. Let's get right to it and dig in. Number one, I want you to recognize the kingdom of heaven is received with childlike faith. The kingdom of heaven is received with childlike faith. 
We read the text a moment ago where Jesus blesses the children. If we're not careful, however, we miss it, and we miss it because oftentimes in our Bibles there will be some things that will be like a little line leading to the next paragraph or the next pericope of Scripture, and we don't see how all of these things are, in fact, connected. So I want you to notice the contrast. The rich young man is talking about doing good deeds in order to have eternal life. His piety of achievement stands in stark contrast to the teaching of Jesus as recorded in Mark chapter 10 and verse 15, where Jesus said, one must receive the kingdom of God like a child. There's no mention there of doing good deeds, right? And then here in chapter 19 of Matthew's Gospel, we see Jesus modeling the reception of children brought to him for a blessing. He says, the kingdom belongs to such as these. That's a very different picture than that of the rich young man, what he's essentially asking, what good he has to do in order to make it into the kingdom. So we see this contrast. A rich young man asking, what do I have to do? And we see children coming to Jesus, and Jesus says, the kingdom belongs to such as these. Jesus lays hands on them. That was simply the traditional way in which children were blessed, in particular if one was passing a blessing from one generation to the next. But the disciples represent the typical viewpoint of the day, the idea that children were afforded a lower status and would not have been permitted to participate fully in society, including whatever religion happened to be under consideration. So the disciples then are offering a rebuke to the people that bring the children to Jesus, and that, by the way, is among the saddest texts in all the Bible. Think about this. Followers of Jesus rebuking people because they brought children to Jesus. Jesus both literally and symbolically moves to include children. His acceptance of them literally as he lays hands on them and bless them is indicative of the symbolic acceptance that they will now experience in the life of the church. He's doing more than just publicly blessing the children. He is saying to the crowd, and he is saying to those children, and he is ultimately saying to the world, children really matter. Right? In fact, we can learn an awful lot from children. The kingdom is received with childlike faith, after all. One of the favorite books that I've ever received was a book that was given to me entitled Children's Letters to God. And I love the honesty of kids. Look at some of these. Dear God, what does it mean you are a jealous God? I thought you had everything. <laughs> Dear God, is Reverend Cole a friend of yours or do you just know him through business? <laughs> Did you really mean do unto others as they do unto you? Because if you did, then I'm going to fix my brother. <laughs> and my favorite, dear God, thank you for the baby brother, but what I prayed for was a puppy. <laughs> I love the honesty of children, don't you, most of the time? But we have to have childlike faith in coming to the kingdom. Matthew has already reminded us of this idea in chapter 18 and verse 3 where he records the words of Jesus who said, Truly I tell you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Children are a paradigm of what it means to be helplessly dependent on the Father. I love every Sunday when the kids from our church, I don't know if they walk, trek, jog, stomp, snort, whatever, on their way to children's church. Don't you love to see the joy that they have as they bound down to the front and they go downstairs to learn more about Jesus? Listen to me. Jesus would not say they're the future church. Jesus would say they are the church in the present. We have to be responsible, you know, in terms of how we help children get to know Jesus. And of course, we want to make sure that they are old enough to understand something of sin and repentance and forgiveness in order to believe, but they don't have to understand Calvin's Institutes in order to be saved. They simply need a childlike faith, a willingness to surrender themselves to what they know of Jesus to begin their journey of faith. We have to deal with children, let's be clear, responsibly. If a child is talking about receiving Christ, 
and we realize as we talk with them or as their parents talk with them that they're not yet mature enough to have the cognitive ability to grasp some things related to sin and repentance, we don't turn them away. We simply celebrate with them their initial steps toward Jesus and we keep teaching them and training them and working with them until they grow in that point to the point of finally understanding. A lot of people would have said, I was too young when I came to faith in Christ. I was a seven-year-old little boy when I believed in the Lord Jesus. And I have sat in classrooms and heard colleagues of mine say, you didn't understand. And I would say, of course I didn't understand. I'm 52. I still don't understand. Do you? Do you understand why the perfect, holy God of the universe would love us as is? I, I still don't understand that. But I want to always maintain a childlike wonder at the thought that for whatever reason, God loves people. And people includes me and you. So I was just a kid, and some would say that's too young. And, and that may be too young for some children. But here's what I'm going to tell you. That moment changed my life. Seven years old. And what I'm telling you is, I have yet to get over it. I've never gotten over that fact. So the kingdom of heaven is received with childlike faith. Not only the kingdom of heaven is received with childlike faith, but secondly, this morning, I want you to recognize sometimes our need is for subtraction rather than addition. Sometimes the need that we have is for subtraction rather than addition. Let's look at a few of these verses. Verse 16, just then someone came up and asked him, teacher, what good must I do to have eternal life? And then skip down with me to verse 21. If you want to be perfect, Jesus said to him, go sell your belongings and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When the young man heard that, he went away grieving because he had many possessions. The second response of Jesus, that is in verse 21, to the man's initial inquiry adds greatly to the discussion. The young man's behavior, in fact, has been exemplary up to this point. He, in fact, has been pretty good. And he will make himself perfect, according to Jesus, if he adds just one more good deed, that is, go sell everything you have, give away your belongings, or sell them and give to the poor. Based, by the way, on this biblical text, the church developed a concept of two classes of Christians. The ordinary Christians who kept their stuff, all their possessions, and then the very religious Christians who took vows of poverty. Now, I never want to lead you astray. I don't want you to ever be moved beyond what Jesus actually says. I don't ever want to water down the words of the Son of God. But let's be clear here, this is not a once-for-all universal command. Jesus didn't tell everybody who comes to him that they would have to sell everything and give the money to the poor in order to come and follow him. It may be, it might be, that Jesus wants you to get rid of some of your things in order to go into a more full and deep relationship, life of service to him. But it may also be that Jesus wants you to use your ability to produce wealth to support great Christian causes around the globe. I don't know. I'm not the Holy Spirit, so I can't tell you exactly what Jesus wants you to do. What I am saying is there has to be balance, obviously, with this. As believers, we have an obligation to be good stewards of God's material blessings. Let me give you a really practical example. When we give the church the presentation about renovating our worship center, I think that that will make even more sense. But let me pause and talk about that for a moment because it fits the point here. We're not talking about transforming this room into a showplace with gold faucets and crystal chandeliers. Lori and I are not going to have air-conditioned dog houses for Maggie and Bo, our two dogs. We're talking about fixing the cracks in the wall, giving the baptismal candidates a decent place to change, our sound engineers are working on eliminating dead spots in the room and hot spots in the room sound-wise, and we're going to have lighting that will actually allow those of you who attend Wednesday night Bible study to read your Bible. Now I know who comes on Wednesday nights, based on who laughed. But anyway, 
The pews are going to be reconfigured somewhat so that every time the guys have to bring in one of those big lifts to change the lights or do some work on the ceiling area, they won't have to unbolt and move three or four of those pews, which, by the way, does not help in terms of their longevity as is. What I'm saying is these are not big luxury items so far, right? No, right? Okay, good. We're going to have our HVAC system replaced. That's a big deal for those of you who appreciate air conditioning. But listen, we're not turning this into a television studio. We're not going to be opulent. I'm not going to start begging for money, asking people to buy the Ken and Lori study Bible with charts and graphs. What I'm saying is we have to do some updates, and that's a, that's a stewardship issue. You've had to update your house, right? We have to update our house of worship. For those of you who live in a home that's 30 years old or more, you know that after 30 years, there are some things that need updating. If you've raised, let's just say, three or four kids, or what is it, 2.2, that's the average now, whatever. I'm not sure how you, how you raised the .2 child, but you know that in that home there's some wear and tear that takes place during the lifetime of your children, much less if you look at 30 years. Everybody wants to take care of their home, right? And we recognize, let's be clear, this is not God's home. He doesn't live here. He lives here. But this is a place where we come to worship, and that's not three or four of us, that's six or seven hundred of us, week in, week out, week in, week out. So there are some things that need to be addressed. So some of it, like the HVAC, just as an example, which, by the way, full disclosure, is going to be a big ticket item, but those are, there will be some things that will be essentially even deferred maintenance. Now, I know these are first world problems. I know that but we built a building to worship in in the first world. So if we're going to have a building, we have to do what we can to take care of it. We have to do some things, put some effort in to keep it functioning well. If we don't do it well now, then we'll be faced with doing a whole lot more in the not-so-distant future. But let me be clear, and this is really the point of all of this, we're not being selfish, we're not being arrogant, we're not discriminating against the poor. We're not utilizing money that we should use for other kinds of ministries to do this. We're taking care of our house of worship so that we can continue doing what this church has done for 160 plus years. That's it. And I think that mentality is healthy to maintain. In fact, what I would say to you is this. I cannot imagine being willing to do more to take care of my own home than I would be willing to do in terms of taking care of my spiritual home. Can you? So 30 years, you guys fixed some things around your house. And if you didn't, I probably don't want to hang out at your house. But most of you did, and we've got to do the same thing. So none of what we're going to do is wrong. What would be wrong would be if we were sinking money into a building but didn't want children inside of it, bounding down the aisle, going downstairs to learn about Jesus. It would be wrong if we wanted to make this a show place, but never wanted to utilize it. It would be wrong if we took pristine care of our own homes, but couldn't care less about what we did with our house of worship. And gratefully, in fact, you guys as a church do care. It would be wrong if we didn't plan on utilizing these facilities to the max for the preaching and teaching of the Word of God for years to come. So what I'm saying is, it's just balance. It's balance. Good deal? Good deal? So it's likely the rich young man would not have made a big deal of things if Jesus had just asked him to give a little more of his income to the poor. I suspect, can't prove it, but I suspect that part of what he minded was giving up not only wealth, but what that means too. Things like privilege, status, economic power. He was identified by his wealth and likely did not want to give that up to gain a new identity. The point is, sometimes in order to be right with God, it's not about adding anything to our lives. For some, it's about subtracting some things from our lives. Tell yourself the truth. In these moments, tell yourself the truth. What might you need to get rid of in order to be fully committed to God? Maybe it's some material thing. If it's your boat, I'll take it. Because <laughs> God hasn't told me not to have a boat yet. 
Maybe it's a toxic relationship. Maybe it's your need to control. Maybe it's your need to control. Maybe it's your need to control. Maybe it's fear about something in life. Maybe it's resentment because at some point along the way, somebody in the church hurt you. Or maybe things in the church didn't go the way you wanted. Maybe it's things haven't gone the way you wanted to go in your family. Here's what I'm saying to you, my brothers and sisters. Let it go. Let it go. Sometimes our need is for subtraction rather than addition. So the kingdom of heaven is received with childlike faith. Sometimes our need is for subtraction rather than addition. Thirdly, nobody is getting to heaven based on false piety. Nobody. Verse 17 and following. Why do you ask me about what is good? He said to him, there is only one who is good. If you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. Which ones, he asked him, which I find that to be kind of humorous, don't you? Like some of the other ones really don't matter. Which ones? Jesus answered, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor your father and your mother, and love your neighbor as yourself. I have kept all these, the young man told him, what do I still lack? Jesus asks him essentially, have you really kept all the commandments, every single one of them, ever since you were a kid? It's as if Jesus asks, how about that commandment regarding coveting? Now, he doesn't ask it that way. Instead, he says, son, if you want to be perfect, go sell all your belongings and give to the poor, and then you'll have treasure in heaven, and then come follow me. Jesus calls him to perfection, perfect in the sense of keeping both tables of the law. Look at what Jesus does in verses 18 and 19. He does something significant with these Ten Commandments. Essentially, he makes two omissions. First, he leaves out the first four commandments, the first table, if you will, of the Ten Commandments. Why does Jesus make this noticeable omission to the man? By quoting only from the second table, as Sean O'Donnell notes, Jesus places the mirror of neighborly love before this man's face. It's as if he's saying, now, how do you look? Have you defrauded anybody to make your fortune? Have you in any way exploited the poor? Have you been compassionate, kind, and generous with what you have? Have you really, really, really loved your neighbor as yourself? You see, Jesus, as the living word, is doing what we know the Bible as the written word does quite well. It tells us the truth just as he tells us the truth. And sometimes it is painful to see the truth about our world, and sometimes it's painful to see the truth about us. But it's necessary in that it's the only way that we might become more like Jesus. So the kingdom of heaven is received with childlike faith. Sometimes our need is for subtraction rather than addition. Nobody is getting to heaven based on false piety. Fourthly, I want you to recognize self-sufficiency is not typically a good match for humility. Look with me at verse 23 and following. Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I tell you, it will be hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. You can't get around this truth. What Jesus is saying is exactly what he said. And what he said was, it's difficult for people that have a lot of stuff, a lot of money, a lot of means in and of themselves to make it into the kingdom of God. That's exactly what this text means. People have tried to explain it away. I know we've all heard the watered-down analogy trying to make this more palatable. We've all heard about the supposed gate in Jerusalem that was called the eye of the needle, and it was really short, and it was difficult but not impossible for a camel to stoop down and go through that. And that may make us feel better about what Jesus said. I just don't think that's what Jesus said. I think Jesus is appealing to a camel that is the largest animal known in Palestine at the time, and then he's talking about a needle, which would have been the smallest hole in an entire household, and he says what he says, and that is it's easier for a camel, the big animal, to get through the eye of a needle. It's easier for that to happen than for a rich person to get into heaven. That's what he says. That reminds me of the words of Mark Twain, the great theologian. It ain't those parts of the Bible that I can't understand that bother me. It's the parts that I do understand. 
Well, number five, only God can turn the impossible into the possible. Verse 25, when the disciples heard this, they were utterly astonished and asked, then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. And then Peter does what Peter does well. He kind of puts his foot in his mouth, and we'll talk more about that next week. Only God can turn the impossible into the possible. With man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. The truth of the matter is, it is absolutely and utterly foolish to cling to anything instead of clinging to Jesus. You may remember that commercial that came out a few years ago, and it showed a group of people gathered around at a gravesite, and they were talking about the wealth of the man who was being buried, and they said, I wonder how much he left. And one of the guys turned to the other one and said, pretty sure all of it. It's ridiculous to hold on to anything other than Jesus. And I know that this makes me a dinosaur, but as archaic, simplistic, and unrealistic as it sounds, Jesus really is the answer. And I'll go one step further. Jesus really is the only answer answer. In her writing, Teaching a Stone to Talk, Annie Dillard recalls the tragic story of the Franklin ex expedition to the North Pole. It took place in 1845, and a group of English explorers died because they were ill-prepared for their challenges that they would face. Instead of providing room on board their two ships for storing additional coal for the steam engines, these careless adventurers used the space. Are you ready for this? They used the space on board for a large library, a large barrel organ, china place settings, and cut glass wine goblets. They were obviously Presbyterian. <laughs> Needless to say, when they ran out of coal, as they did, their books and teacups and ornate musical instruments were not enough to warm their freezing bodies, every member of that expedition died. 128 men lost their lives. Years later, when the search party found the remains of the men who had set off to walk for help, they discovered one skeleton dressed in a fine blue cloth uniform edged with silk braid, sadly grasping in one hand a place setting of sterling silver flatware. He was holding on to something that really did not matter at all. Let's not be guilty of doing the same thing. 